Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Uh, I see so, uh, many familiar faces, and uh, I have come to get addicted to you guys. Um, it's difficult to say this is the last time I will uh, have the great honor to be with you. And thank you to you for inviting me. And since it's the last night, I, I should also mention that I feel honored uh, to be the person who started this lecture series. I have the highest respect for Professor Yasha Ter. Mm, although I never had the honor to be her students, but he was my mentor, and he continues to be. So today we are going to wrap up our conversation about Furo Farouk um, Just two minutes of wrapping up everything we have done so far together. We talked about her life. Um, the difficulties she conf uh, confronted as a young woman, uh, perhaps the physical trauma. Um, we read some of, um, we did a close reading of some of her poems, some of the letters. Um, to ask the question, what was this question? What was this secret that Farouk Farouk Saad wanted us uh, to decipher? Uh, in the second session, we discussed uh, some of the major tropes in Farouk poetry. Um, love, of course, the proximity to death, uh, and of course, freedom of movement. And we said that this freedom is really at the basis of several other kinds of freedom in a sex-segregated society. Uh, yesterday, uh, we watched uh, her master film, uh, master, uh, really, uh, uh, work of um, exceptional quality, one of the 10 best documentaries considered by many in the world. Uh, and we discussed how it indeed is a model for life narratives. And today, um, I want to discuss with you um, how Farouk Saad redefined the very definition of family in Iran and the significance of that uh, in a culture in which um, family was the unit. Um, and according to her, uh, at least the way I read it, and in my view, is really a mirror and a reflection of the larger society. So if defying age-old patterns of gender apartheid um, is the central trope uh, of Farrakhsad's artistic universe, advocating, but more importantly, mirroring the shifting lines of power within the family is its most consequential outcome. Not much has been written about this important aspect of Farouk Zod's poetry. Yet, what she has done in redefining the family unit is truly exceptional and pioneering. Obviously, Farouk Zad, who developed by leaps and bounds in the very short 13-year literary career she had, changed her views and her perspectives on um, family, um, on motherhood, uh, on gender relations. Let me give you one example. You might remember um, the poem Wedding Band, Halqe. It's one of her first poems. Uh, it was published in the collection Captive, Asir. So if you recall the poem, 
the poem is made of two sections. In the first one, there is a young, vivacious, energetic woman, um, young girl, very happy, uh, full of questions. She's asking, what's the secret of this band um, that is around my finger? And in the second part of that same poem, uh, the young woman um, is now um, an older woman, and she has come uh, to the sad conclusion that this band is the band of submission, uh, submissiveness, and bondage. Bandeye uh, Bardigi talks about Halqiye uh, Bardigi. Bondage. So um, I have not come across any Iranian writer uh, of the modern era that had, had so fundamentally questioned um, the very construction uh, of um, family units in Iran. Now, we know gender relation in Iran is a very complex, very fascinating issue. Uh, I want to take a few minutes to talk about some of the expressions we have. Uh, for instance, um, we call um, the groom on the night of his wedding Shadamat. We call a woman who is a shrew, salite. And it's no coincidence that salite and saltanat, a shrew and kinship, and salte, dominance, come from the exact same root. It is no coincidence that one of our most popular, at least when I was growing up in Iran, uh, proverb was about wedding night was, Gorbaro bayat shabe hejle kosht. You kill um, the cat uh, at the nuptial night or in the nuptial chamber. Does anyone know? the story behind this very popular and famous proverb? Nobody. And yet we use it all the time, right? We still use it. So it took me a long, long time to find the story. So I'm going to just take a few minutes of your precious time to tell you that story because it's so fascinating. Um, so very similar. Uh, to the taming of the shrew of Shakespeare. There is this young woman uh, who is a shrew, uh, comes from a good family, and of course nobody wants to marry her. The father finally comes up with an idea and proposes a good uh, dowry for the daughter, and this uh, man um, says that I'm going to marry her. And everybody tries to tell her, but you can't do that. You don't want to do that. And he says, don't worry. I can handle her. So he marries her. And when they enter the nuptial chamber, uh, he had arranged uh, ahead of time to have a cat in, in the nuptial chamber. So as they get in, husband and wife, uh, just newly wed, he um, looks at the cat and he says, go get me a glass of water. Well, the poor cat didn't know what was going on. He, he meowed and uh, was happy. Um, two minutes later, he said, didn't you hear me? I said, you go um, fetch a glass of water for me. I'm thirsty. And, and the cat didn't again. And the th uh, third time, 
Uh, he took his dagger out and he beheaded the innocent cat and with the bloody dagger in his hand looked at the bride and said, you see that? Uh, I'm thirsty. Please go get me a glass of water. And the wife, of course, did. And the pattern was set. Because in most relationship, in the first few minutes of that relationship, a pattern is set for the relationship. So a neighbor heard the story and said, my God, why didn't I think of such a simple thing? So he got, um, they had a pet, a cat. He went and he got himself a nice big dagger. They went to the bedroom and he looked at the cat and he said, go get me a glass of water. And uh, nobody said anything. He repeated it. The, the third time, the wife looked at him. He said, the one who killed the cat was in the nuptial chamber not 20 years into the marriage. You want a glass of water, you go get yourself one. And by the way, get me one too. So, um, yeah, but to get you a glass of water. <laughs> you, you don't want any. <laughs> You're not taking chances. Not, not chances. Plenty of water, thanks. no cats. <laughs> So, <laughs> in other words, if we call our brides king bride on the day of their wedding, it's not for no reason. It's not coincidental. Furo Farouk revised that gender relation. I'm not claiming she's the first one who did that. We know. Um, that many had already started doing that in their families. I say that as a Muslim woman. I know that, for instance, in the Babi faith, especially in the Baha'i faith, gender relation was of utmost importance. But when it comes to our literary production, I don't know of any poem, of any novel, of any short story, like the one I will read for you. I can't read the whole thing because I've promised a few of you told me you didn't get enough time for Q&A. I would like to leave a lot of room for Q&A today. Uh, I think many of you are familiar with the poem. I will read a few lines of it so you have a sense of uh, the music of it, of course, in English and with my inefficient translation, but I will perhaps read a few lines of the Persian too. So it's, a, it's one of Furul's most anthologized poems for sure. And um, I think one of the most radical. So in Persian, it is Ankalaki ke parid as faroz sarma va fururaf dar andishe ye ashufte abri velgat khabar ma ra khahat bord beshad. همه میدانند همه میدانند من و تو از آن روزنه سرد ابوس باغ را دیدیم سیب را چیدیم so the crow that flew over us and sunk in the anxious thoughts of a vagrant cloud its cry crossing the horizon like a short spear will carry our tail to the city. Everyone knows, everyone knows that you and I caught sight of the garden through that cold, grim opening. Everyone knows, everyone knows that we picked the apple from that fey distant branch. Everyone fears, everyone fears but you and I, 
merged with the lamp, the water, and the mirror, and we did not fear. It's not a matter of two names grafted feebly to each other on the old pages of a registry. What matters are our kisses, puppy flowers, singed, and my tresses full of bliss. What matters is the intimacy between our naked bodies, bold, <coughs> glittering, like fish scales in the water. So you know the rest of the story. It's a man and a woman. They see the apple inside the garden, and they enter the garden. And then it's after they enter the garden that with their hands, with holding their hands together, uh, they make a bridge overnight. And at the end, Farrokhzad tells us that it's not a matter of whispers in the dark. It's a matter of daylight. It's a matter of telling it as it is. So, you know, at the time, Farah Zod was uh, a divorced woman um, with a child. She was denied even sporadic visitation rights with that child. And the man for whom this poem was written uh, we know it because she says it in the book, e.g., Ibrahim Golestan was the man who had hired her, as we talked about it, uh, when she was 24 years old. So in this story, in order to change gender relations in Iran, Farrokhzad goes to the beginning of creation. The garden she enters is the Garden of Eden, of course. And the man and the woman are Adam and Eve. And in fact, in one of the letters published in the book, she says it specifically, that you are my Adam and I am the Eve. So we know for a fact that this poem is indeed more than only autobiographical. Uh -huh. There is a connection between the poet and the woman inside the poem. But the story of creation is completely revived in this, in this story, in this poem. If picking of the apple caused the downfall of Adam and Eve, if it, the children of Eve were denied immortality, because what is the characteristic relationship of all paradises that we know? Death dies in paradise. There is no death. And it was after, in many uh, versions of the story, when Eve picked up the apple and suggested it to Adam, uh, that the children of Eve, all of us, were kicked out of paradise and doomed to mortality. Not in this poem. In this poem, Adam and Eve see the apple, enter the garden. The temptation, the tree of knowledge leads to their paradise. In fact, they reach eternity by picking the apple, by accepting knowledge. That's one thing that is fan fantastic. That's an acknowledgment of love and sexuality as a passport to paradise, rather than as a kicking out of it. But in most versions of the creation story, it's Eve who is held responsible for tempting Adam. In the Judeo-Christian version, 
and in the popular versions in my country of birth, which I love, Iran, it's still Eve who is held responsible for the temptation and for deceiving and therefore being the cause of all that. I have to add parenthetically here that not so in the Quran. In the Quran, it was not Eve who tempted and who deceived Adam. But even some of our best theologians have disregarded that in favor of the Eve who is the temptress. In this poem, every time a decision has to be made, if they have to enter the garden, if they have to pick the apple, she never uses the pronoun we. It's you and I. Manoto. The two pronouns are, re are repeated several times in that poem. So this Eve is completely a different Eve. She's not the temptress. She's not the cause of our fall. And she is proud of doing what she does. But she's also blessed with a companion who doesn't need a scapegoat. She's blessed with a companion who is not going to hold her responsible for tempting him. And she also acknowledges that. And at the end, it is, she tells us, it is with this kind of a gender relation, it's with this kind of a man and a woman that we can create paradise. And we can bridge a build and build light over darkness. And indeed, as we know, she has created this poem, which is considered by many one of the masterpieces of Persian modern literature. So quite clearly, um, the rupture of tradition, especially when it comes to this redefinition of family life, of gender relation, has been the most difficult for a group of more traditional-minded people to accept in Iran. What I find fascinating and what I have believed in and have consistently argued for, and I do that as a feminist, and I'm proud to be one, I say it's not only the changes that women brought about. Men were also instrumental. That's why I call it a gender revolution. Um, I don't believe in us or them. I believe in us and them, as did Furukh Farukh said. Now, you can cherry pick a poem here, uh, a message there. Uh, in which Farrokh Saad is upset about a relationship. But generally speaking, what she has done to gender relations in Iran is unique. Now, this was about gender relations. And I want to take a few minutes of your time to talk about how what she has done is considered dangerous in Iran, even of today, 60, 70 years later. In a minute, I will talk about um, Farrukh Zad with her biological son. This is Kamyar Shapur. The reason I want to start with that is because later on, I will tell you that for the last 10, 11 years, of her short life, there is not a single picture of this mother with her own, with her only biological child. And 
we need to discuss these issues. We need to request a change in our laws, in our custodial rights, that make not only the mother suffer, but also the child suffer. Um, so I was, um, this, you know, is, um, I'm very grateful to Khanume Soraya Shakibai, who kindly gave me all these pictures that I don't think we, are, we had access to. This is Furukh Farrokhzad in the leprosarium. And you remember that when she went to make that masterfi masterpiece of a film, uh, The House is Black, she's the woman sitting there. And uh, you see, out of respect for the population there, she's wearing a scarf. Um, and you remember that we talked about the reason that film is a masterpiece partly is because of the relationship she could establish with the inhabitants of this ostracized group of people. Um, and um, here's another one, Furuk, and the five uh, men who accompanied her uh, to the leprosarium. Oh, I went to the back one. And this is, if you remember, the scene in the film, uh, uh, um, in uh, the classroom. Um, and the son she, ad uh, she adopted is the second son sitting right there. So for the last 11, 10 uh, years of her life, missing any picture of this mother who became an ex-mother. Because motherhood is not a right in Iran. Motherhood is a privilege. A mother can be denied her rights of motherhood. And indeed, she was. So these are um, some of the uh, pictures in the last five, six years of her life after uh, she adopted Hossein. Hossein Mansouri um, is there. She's here, and this is Furuk in one of her very happy moments, uh, playing guitar uh, with a broom. Uh, and uh, uh, the woman next to her is her mother, uh, Turan Khanum Farrokhzad, who was a most delightful person. And this is Furuk and her adoptive son. Another picture. And you see all the family pictures um, uh, are also with Hossein, and uh, you never see Kamyar um, in any of them. Um, this is uh, the, the woman in green is Furu Farahzad, and that's um, the father. Um, and uh, the woman sitting next to her is Gloria, and the young man is the younger brother. Uh, who unfortunately passed away. Now, I wanted to tell you about how um, things have changed in Iran um, and how threatening these changes are uh, for, a, for the other Iran. I think we really can say that Iran is a land of paradoxes and that there are two Irans. Um, I'm hoping there will be more and more communication between the two, and surely there is. Uh, it uh, has started. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. Um, four books in the last um, few months, few years, have been published in Iran with these amazing titles. Um, you, uh, you know, Zan Zalil, the other one, Nasreddin Shah Zan Zalil, uh, uh, um, Pen Hecht, Ma what do you say? Hen Pecked Man, um, as uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger would say, a girly man. Um, 
And even Nasreddin Shah, the epitome, you know, the king who ruled Iran for 50 years, he's now considered Zanzalil. Um, um, and then these are the pictures. Um, uh, uh, these are the covers of these books. Uh, um, you know, they are fascinating to read. Um, it is really about the fear of this rampant uh, matriarchy that is going to deprive Iran um, of its uh, uh, culture, uh, that is going to uh, make men um, prisoners of the home. Um, you know, if in a few years, four books can, four books that I know can be published with the title Zanzalil, a uh, um, hand-picked man in it, um, we should understand then why Furul Farrohzad was one of the first poets to be banned after the revolution. And now, that finally, her poem, because people love her, because she has become an icon, because she's considered a cultural hero, her books are po uh, published, but in a most mutilated form. And if you compare the published books in recent decades in Iran, in the last decade in Iran, with the original ones, you will discover something fascinating. That the poems that have been excised, that have been cut, have disappeared from the face of the page, are generally speaking, in one form or another, about family relationships. Um, you know, um, we talked about how there has been about um, 80, um, 82 or three poem, uh, letters of Farrokhzad that have been published so far. Um, we don't know who has censored them. There are exceptionally few, if any, that have not been censored. So I have a few of the original letters that I also have the censored form published and available in Iran. So I compared them line by line, word for word. Even in the letters, the sections that are cut relate to family. So does it surprise us then that even before uh, the ratification of the Constitution, even before the Islamic, um, the Republic of Iran had turned into the Islamic Republic of Iran, the one law that was immediately rescinded was the family law. And it's not like they completely overhauled everything. You know, they gave some custodial rights to the mother. Um, they banned, kind of uh, banned polygamy. Uh, divorce was no longer a unilateral right. That, more than the law regarding um, the veil, was the first one. The Islamic Republic of Iran knew very well, or at least thought very well, that to build an Islamic country, you have to revise the family structure. Hence, um, the um, family law was completely, was the first one to be resented. I, I, I find this quite a telling phenomenon. Now, how much more time I have, Okay. So, you know, 
know, I also wanted to talk a little bit about, because it's such an um, important issue to me, about the issue of adoption. Furu Farrokhzad went to a leprosarium at a time when um, it was thought leprosy is a contagious disease. And she adopted a son from that leprosarium, brought him home, and stayed with him, took care of him at times when he was traveling. He stayed with the mother. You know, Farouk had a very busy life, and she suffered all her life in, a, in her attempt to reconcile the life of a mother with that of a poet. She never quite succeeded. We know why. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. You need leisure, uh, you need in economic independence, you need what Virginia Woolf said, a room of your own. And I love Virginia Woolf. I have, her work has really had an impact on me. And I want to add to a room of one's own that yes, you need a room of your own to be able to become a writer. But more importantly, you also need the, the permission to leave that room and to enter it at will. Otherwise, that room is going to turn into a cell, into a prison cell. That's a definition, another definition of sex segregation to me. It denies you that freedom to leave that will. That's central to Farrokhzad's poetry. When Farrokhzad adopted Hussein Mansouri, and to this day, we do not still have a Persian word for adoption. The words we have are derogatory. And they are not a single word, they are a phrase. Bache Sadarahi, a child picked up by the road. How insulting can that be? Or um, farzand khande, a um, disant a child only by name. Adoption was not an option when Farrokhzad adopted Hussein Mansouri. And we know for a fact that she did talk to Mr. <laughs> and Mrs. Mansouri. And it was with their ex um, permission that she adopted Hussein Masuji. Um, it's true that five years after the adoption of um, Hussein, um, after Farrokhzad passed away, um, that's pre-revolutionary time, for a few years they changed the law of adoption. Um, if a husband and wife uh, could not have a child for five years, they could apply for adoption. But even then, a single parent could not adopt a child. And Furu Farrokhzad adopted Hossein Mansouri as a single parent. So um, I want to uh, stay within my time limit and um, end with what I think is the other side of the coin of what Farrokhzad wanted to do with the family. As you might recall, I said one of the most endear uh, endearing things to me about Farrokhzad was a, a number of things. The two that we discussed um, in the last uh, three sessions was one that she knew telling the truth is her obligation. But she didn't stop there. She also argued that hearing the truth is her right. And in a culture that for over thousands of years, our motto has been to tell the truth. That's not a small deed. And 
I'm not saying she never lied. That uh, Farouk herself has said repeatedly in her letters, and Farouk is not uh, infallible. She she might have, but her ideal was to be as honest as she can be. And I think most of the time she succeeds. The second thing, and we talked about the role of Farouk Saad in modernity, in Iranian modernity, her fight and struggle from early childhood, in fact, for freedom, all kinds of freedom, freedom of expression, um, freedom of movement, and we talked about to have a voice, to own her body, to fall in love, um, um, and, but even there, she didn't stop there. She always argued that with freedom comes responsibility. You cannot ask for freedom and not accept the responsibilities that come with it. Um, you remember the first poem she published was a poem beginning with, I sinned. That was after the coup d'etat of 1953. All the fingers were pointing at someone else. It was the American government, it was the two the party, it was Zahid, it was this, it was that. And here's a woman, just barely 20. She comes and breaks that discourse by screaming and saying, but I am the one who sinned. And she always did that. She accepted responsibility for the freedom she sought. She did the same with family. And I want to end with one of the poem that is anthologized over and over again. But I want to look at it from a different perspective. It's the poem, I Feel Sorry for the Garden. Delam baraye bachje mi so you, you know, uh, it's a woman, uh, it's a poet, um, who sees the garden um, that she loves. That obviously is a metaphor for the country. Um, is dying. And she holds every member of her family responsible for that death of the garden. You know, first, let me read a few lines of this poem to you that was published in the 1960. Um, I think the first time this poem was published was in 1963 or 64. I want to suggest this is the first and the most prescient acknowledgement of an upcoming revolution in Iran. I don't know of anybody else, in prose or in poetry, who acknowledged death and destruction. Let me just read a few lines of it. I, I hope you will read the whole poem. It's, uh, it's really an amazing poem. All day long, the sound of blasts and explosions can be heard. Instead of flowers, instead of flowers, our neighbors plant mortars and machine guns in their garden. They store gunpowder in their covered pools. The kids in our neighborhood, the kids in our neighborhood fill their backpacks with little bombs. 
And then after this prediction of bloodshed, of death and destruction, she talks about the father who is reading Nasek o Tawarikh and Shahnameh Ferdowsi, old glories of Iran, books about Iran and in its glorious days, and is not feeling responsible for the death of the garden. She talks about the mother, who is constantly at her prayer rug, praying and blowing to flowers and to trees and to everything that is dying. And the flower, the brother, the intellectual, she tells us, her anguish and her despair is so small that every night he can go to a bar and drink it away. And the sister, the sister every time she comes to our house is pregnant and she covers herself with perfume and, um, so that the poverty of the garden doesn't touch her skirt. But again, she doesn't stop there. And she says, but I know this garden can be taken to a hospital. And she insists three times, midanam, midanam, midanam. I know it. I know it can be cured. I know it. I often wonder. What would have happened to our history, to all of us, had our politicians listened a bit more carefully to what was written in this poem? And others like it. This is the first one that I've come across, and this is the one I absolutely love. So I want to end with a happy note. I have argued for the last 12, 13 years that we constantly talk about two revolutions in the modern uh, Iran. The Constitutional Revolution of 1905-1911, the Islamic Revolution of 1979. But in fact, a more important revolution has also happened in Iran, a gender revolution, a bloodless revolution. Surely, it does not match the traditional definitions of uh, revolutions. But if our other two revolutions only managed to replace one tyrant for another, one tyrant who was educated in a house in which democracy did not rule. In this revolution, we are changing the structure of power, not in the halls of power, but in every single home, in every kitchen, and in every bedroom. That's how I think. Iran is changing. That's the hope for our future of Iran. And I hope that uh, we will all see that happy day where equality and justice rules at home and in the country. Because you cannot have democracy and justice in a country if there is no democracy and justice at all. Thank you.